online. Merry Christmas to you wherever you are in the world. If you're in the overflow rooms, thanks for coming. If you're right here in the Crown Ridge Auditorium, thank you so much for being a part of this special Christmas evening. Christmas is a season of interruptions. Some of them we like, some of them we don't. We enjoy interrupting the Christmas we enjoy interrupting the office work for the Christmas office party. We enjoy interrupting the diet for the eggnog. <laughs> we enjoy interrupting the bill paying for the Christmas card reading. Some of the interruptions we like, some of them we don't. We could do without that Chicago snowstorm that grounds the Atlanta flight that leaves us stranded in Albuquerque. We could do without that phone call that comes at the middle of the night from our second cousin, Bert, saying that he and Mary Lou and the kids are going to be in the area for the holidays. And, oh, could they park their Winnebago in our driveway <laughs> for about 10 days? Some interruptions we could do without. But the truth is, interruptions are a part of Christmas. In fact, Christmas is one big interruption. God tapped humanity on the collective shoulder and said, <clears throat> pardon my interruption. And eternity entered time. Divinity entered humanity. And heaven interrupted history in the form of a baby. Heaven is one big interruption. God isn't finished. He's still busy about the task of interrupting lives. What he did in Bethlehem is just a picture of what he wants to do with you and me. He wants to blow the darkness out of the night. He wants to fill the night with music. And most of all, he wants to lead you and he wants to lead me to a personal encounter with the gift of of Bethlehem, Jesus Christ. That's really what he's up to. And to do it, sometimes he's prone to use interruptions. I wonder how many, in fact, how about a show of hands? Have you had your life interrupted in the last 12 months? <laughs> Any surprise come your way? You thought you were headed down this road and now you're headed down that road? Things got a little flip-flop just when you thought you could sell the crib. Surprise! <laughs> just when you thought you could retire. Surprise! Just when you thought your health was going to stabilize. Surprise. Or just when you thought things couldn't get worse. Sometimes they get better. And then sometimes they get worse. Surprise, surprise. Life comes with surprises. We, we really... We really can't live a life without interruptions. The presence of interruptions, well, that we have no choice. But the way we respond to interruptions in our lives, well, we have a huge choice. 
In fact, the way we respond to interruptions really defines much of our lives. We can get bitter, we can get angry, we can grow resentful, or we can get better. We can become prayerful. We can say, Lord, are you trying to get my attention here? It's what the shepherds did. Not first, mind you. Initially, the shepherds were afraid. But their initial panic led to ultimate praise, even then proclamation. And because they received this interruption as a work of God, they actually saw the greatest work of God, the Son of God. Their story begins like this. That night, some shepherds were in the fields nearby watching their sheep. I don't know how boring your life is, but it's not <laughs> anything like that. I mean, watching sheep sleep. <laughs> Dollsville. <sighs> we count sheep to go to sleep. Their job was to watch the sheep sleep. I can hardly say that in a sentence. They watch the sheep sleep. <laughs> their goal was to be able to tell the missus when they got home the next morning hey nothing happened last night the sheep just slept their goal was to have a tranquil night no interruptions any interruption would have been a bad interruption right a poacher or, or a thief or a mountain lion they coveted calmness they treasured tranquility they wanted the predictable so do you you've had enough change I want everything just to settle down no more change no more talk about this fiscal cliff no more transition I've had enough change, thank you. Lord, my prayer is that things would just be calm. And sometimes they are. Sometimes God comes to us in calm times. But then again, sometimes he comes through a burning bush in the middle of a desert. Sometimes he takes a prophet and plucks him up and plops him in a lion's den or in a whale's belly. Sometimes he comes to us through tranquil afternoons, but sometimes he comes walking in the middle of a storm. Sometimes he lets things get stirred up just so we'll see him in a new way, in a new light, in a new power that we've never seen before. Not all interruptions come from God. I understand that. The devil has his share. And I think sometimes lives get interrupted just because we make stupid choices. But I do believe that all interruptions fall under the sovereignty of God. And that He can use everything, everything, good and bad, to advance His cause. And He wants to use the interruptions that have come into your life. In the same way, He used the interruptions that He brought into the life of lives of these shepherds he just wants you to see Jesus the story continues with the shepherds then an angel of the Lord stood before them the glory of the Lord was shining around them and they became very worshipful did I just misread that oh they became very happy did I just misread that they became very frightened who would have thought angels choirs, personal appearance of an angel from heaven, and these guys panic. They're afraid. They huddle up. Their heart beats. Hearts beat. <laughs> they freak out. We still do. Have you ever noticed this? That change always brings fear before it brings faith. Change always brings fear before it brings faith. 
Whenever there's a change, whenever, things hap- whenever something happens that we didn't think would happen, do, do you assume the worst? phone rings in the middle of the night you don't assume hey I just won the lottery you assume something bad has happened right we just assume the worst change always brings fear before it brings faith and some people never leave the posture of fear they remain in the place of panic and that's where some of you are right now what God wants to you do this Christmas is move you from a place of fear to a place of faith. But sometimes to get our attention, he has to settle us down. And he says, now don't be afraid. That's what the angel said to them. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Today, your Savior was born in the town of David. He is Christ the Lord. This interruption is not about bad news. This interruption is about good news. Today, your Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. Three titles for Jesus, Savior, Christ, and Lord. And to help the shepherds find Jesus, the angel gives them three clues or three signs he says you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger now that's interesting isn't it look at it again you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger so there's the three clues Savior, Christ, and Lord. I would think, I mean the three titles I would think the three clues would be gold, throne, and castle But instead, the three clues are, look for a baby, he's wrapped in rags, and he's sleeping in a feed trough. And you can just see the fear of the shepherds begin to melt away. Because you see, if Jesus had come on a throne or in a castle, the shepherds couldn't have seen him. But the message of the coming of Christ is that Christ has come so far that he will meet you right, you right wherever you are. And the shepherds believed. And they went and saw him. What an unexpected gift. What an unexpected way for Christ to come. You know, I'm finding it increasingly difficult to surprise anyone with an unexpected gift. Fortunately, I married a wife who always gives me good hints on what I can give her for Christmas. I remember just a couple of years ago, Dean Lynn and I were in another city, and the hotel we were staying at was adjacent to a shopping mall. And so we went in to walk around. It was about Christmas time, maybe right after Thanksgiving, and all the lights were up and the decorations were up. We were walking through the shopping mall, and there was a jewelry store. She went in, and like the good pup husband that I am, I followed her. <laughs> and we went into the jewelry store. And there she spotted a little something something in the glass counter. And she asked the sales attendant if she could see it. And so she pulled it out and Deanlin looked at it. And Deanlin oohed and awed, and the sales lady kind of oohed and awed. They both liked it very much. And then Dean Lynn turned and looked at me. And in that cadence that people use when they don't think the listener speaks English, <laughs> she said, Max, I like this. <laughs> and the sales attendant got in on the cadence. She said, Sir, she likes this. About that time it began to dawn on me, they're in cahoots. <laughs> this is two on one. I'm outnumbered. Deanland said, Christmas is next month, Max. Sales lady said, you can pick this up at any point, sir. What was the product number in the catalog, Dean Lynn asked. It's 251, the sales lady answered. And they looked at me. Hints began falling 
like angels from the heavens. And I appreciate that. Yes, Dean Lynn ended up with a little something something. I need the help. I need all the hints I can get when it comes to giving people gifts. But God does not. No one ever dropped a hint to heaven. Any way you could send us a Savior? No one ever suggested to him, we need a Lord down here to die for us and to pay for our sins. Long before we knew we needed a Savior, we had one born in Bethlehem. And long before we even dared to dream of grace, grace was born and placed in a manger. And that's what the shepherds saw. The shepherds saw the grace of God. His name, Christ the Lord. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. If you follow the response of the shepherds, you see first they panicked and then they praised and then they proclaimed. What began as a source of fear quickly became a source of faith and hope. Why? Because they trusted God to use this interruption to advance his cause. Because of Bethlehem, folks, we know God is up to something good. And we may not understand everything that he is doing, but we know this. He means good, and every action emerges from his good heart. Some of you are standing exactly where the shepherd stood that night, and your world has been interrupted, and you're not quite sure how to respond. You have stood and are standing where the shepherds stood. And I'd just like to ask you this question. Would you be willing to hear what the shepherds heard the message to the shepherds was simply this don't be afraid don't be afraid don't be afraid may the birth of Jesus banish the fear from your heart do you know that you don't have to live in a posture of fear do you know that you don't have to let your life be defined by fear the Bible says Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. If we could somehow unwrap your heart and look at the emotion that's ruling, that's sitting on the throne, that's calling the shots, would we say, oh, peace, peace rules the day? Or what would we find? Fear running the show. Worry Leading the way? Here's my question. How much good has worry done you? Has your anxiety turned you into a better person? Do you ever have your family members come up and say, we wish you would worry just a little bit more because we love it when you're anxious? (laughs) Has worry ever brought you a good night's sleep? No, but peace will. Trust will. Faith will. Did you know it's possible to live with less fear? I don't know if any of us will ever get to the point where we have no fear, but I'm confident we can get to the point where we have less fear. And could it be that the angel's message to you and to you and to you is simply this, don't be afraid. Don't go through life afraid reacting in anxiety you say well how do I diminish the fear in my life I mean if I had an angel come and talk to me that'd be helpful yeah how do I diminish the fear in my life I know someone who can help us here her name is Rebecca Taylor that's her in the middle of the photo She's surrounded by other angels. 
She's 10 years old. And that picture was taken right here in this room just a few weeks back in the kids' praise presentation. Yeah, Rebecca's sitting in a wheelchair. And if you were able to look even more closely, you would see an oxygen tube beneath her nose. For two and a half of her 10 years, Rebecca has battled pancreatitis. Such a severe form of pancreatitis that the best doctors in the country are puzzled. They don't know what to do. But they know this, and they've told her parents that no pain register, no pain chart is adequate to describe the level of pain she lives with every day. Just a couple of weeks back, she was awake for almost 72 consecutive hours because of pain. Yet when you visit Rebecca, you don't find fear. You don't find anxiety. In fact, when you visit Rebecca, she might want to show you a book she's writing. A book that documents the miracles of God in her life. When the pain level has subsided subsided sufficiently for her to pull out her pen and paper, that's what she likes to work on. She's writing a book that documents the miracles in her life. She's 10 years old. For a fourth of her life, she's been in pain, in and out of hospitals. And yet she wants to write a book documenting all the good things that God has done for her. If I'd spent a fourth of my life in pain, my book would be called Lamentations. (laughs) Complaints. Belly aches. How I got the short end of the deal. When she's not working on her book, she's planning the Christmas party for the whole hospital floor. When I was up there the other day, I saw three Christmas cards that she had personally crafted for three different nurses. She had some 20 yet to go. She'll be in surgery again before the week is up. But she wants to have the party first. Here's what Rebecca has taught me. If your focus is on your problem in pain, you're going to be a fear-ridden heart. If all of your focus is on the problems and pain that has come into your life, you might as well prepare yourself for a life of misery. Because when you focus on your problems and pain, that creates a coward, right? Because you just assume, well, this is my life. This is going to happen again. You assume the worst before you believe in the best. But when you do what Rebecca is doing, when you focus on all of the great things that God has done, when you find the big miracles and the small ones, when you document those, when you list those, when you let your focus be on how good God is, instead of reacting with fear, you react with faith. Because you have this list of accomplishments that God has done in your life, and you say, well, He did it here. I think He'll get me through another one. We all have interruptions in life. It's just our response to interruptions are different. Young Rebecca's world has been interrupted, but she's responding with faith. Would you be willing to hear what the shepherds heard? May the birth of Jesus banish the fear from your life. You don't have to live in fear, my friend. And then lastly, would you be willing to go where the shepherds went? Would you? They went to see Jesus. I mean, it was pretty impressive that they had a personal audience with an angel. That would have been sufficient, right? They had the sky full of angels. That would have been enough (laughs) to talk about for a lifetime. But they didn't stay around to see more angels. They really wanted to see their Savior. They really, they made haste, the scripture says. And they came with haste. 
and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. They put on their Adidas and they ran as fast as they could. They just wanted to see Jesus. Everything happened. Everything that happened led up to this moment in which they saw Jesus. The interruption, the light, the music, the angels, everything that happened, happened so they would see Jesus. And I'm saying and believing that everything that is happening in your life and mine can be used by God to help us see Jesus. Everything. And you know what? That's what God wants. Does he want you to be rich or president or a prince or a princess? Maybe. I don't know. But I know this much. He wants you to see Jesus. Because it is in Jesus that you find the Savior of your soul and the purpose of your life. It is in Jesus that you see God himself. And that's God's passion for you. Now my hunch is you haven't experienced the last of your interruptions. They're probably coming next year. But may God equip you to face your interruptions with faith and not fear. By the way, we're all looking to the greatest interruption of all, right? And word has it that there's a trumpet in some corner in the hallways of heaven. And an angel is just waiting for that signal to reach over and grab that trumpet and give it a blast. And God will interrupt this version of history with the greatest version, the version for which we're all looking, dreaming, and we're prepared. Amen? And so, Heavenly Father, we welcome that interruption. Until then, we understand your interruptions between now and then are used just to draw us closer to you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we could respond now with more faith and less fear, and we just trust you. In Jesus' name. And all the church said... Because of bad